was praying this morning about a scripture to read or a verse to read to open our service, and and I was in my mind, I was asking the Lord, like, what, what scripture reveals the heart of the Father? And He laughed at me because scripture, all of it, <laughs> scripture reveals the heart of the Father, and and <laughs> if we look for it everywhere we open the scripture and open the word to should reveal the heart of the Father. But today, so he, he laughed at me and I laughed and then he actually did give me a, a verse that I, I thought I'd read today. This is from Ephesians chapter two. I'm gonna just start at verse 17 and read to the end of the chapter. Verse 17, he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of His household. Built on the foundation of Him, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Jesus Christ Himself as the cornerstone, and in Him the whole building is joined together and rises up to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Amen. Amen. That's a good word. That's, that's who he is, and it's who we are. I mean, that's, that is, I mean, that's actually written on one of the corner, you know, one of the stones on, on our church in the front of the building. That's who he is, and that's who we are. And so, Lord, I just give this service to you, Lord. I ask that everybody here would, would, would not leave here without knowing your heart a little bit more. That we would not leave here without knowing who we are, our identity in Christ, just a little bit more today. Just use our time together as, as part of the process that you are working in us and through us, Lord. So we give you this time. We submit it to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Can't add much more to that. So, good morning, church. Good to see everybody this morning. When you walked in this morning, you, uh, sometimes I want to say whether you want one or not, you got your connect card. So hopefully you make use of that. Tear off that stub, get it in the offering basket if you're a regular attender. Pam gets your prayer requests and praise reports out. And if you're a visitor, um, our connect table set up kind of in front of our connect wall there. and. Uh, we're still working on that, work in progress, but it'll be it'll be completed soon. But if you're a visitor, just uh, fill out this form, and uh, if you want to stop and visit somebody back by that table after service, somebody will be there to uh, greet you and uh, answer some questions. So make use of that. It's it's just a good way to get connected with the church. As we move on in our worship this morning, we're going to take our offering. So if the deacons will get ready, um, I, I, I just can't change the way I do this. It's a good, joyful thing to give back to God some of what he's given to us. Amen. He provides for us. And then we give some of it back and then watch what he does. He ministers to people. He ministers to countries. He ministers to you know, people right here in our own church. He keeps the lights on for us. It's just a really a great, it's just a good opportunity to be, to be involved. Sometimes you don't think you can be involved, you're too busy or, or you just don't have, you know, you just don't have the time or the patience. This is a way to be involved in your church. So Father, we just thank you for that opportunity to join with you and uh, help you to spread the gospel. And we can do it word of mouth, Lord, we know that, but a lot of times in today's age, you've got to have the financial resources to reach out to those around us and to keep our building functioning for everybody that comes in and uses it. 
So Father, thank you for this opportunity. We do it joyfully, not grudgingly. And the most important thing is we do it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, we're going to run through a pretty good list. There's a page and a half of announcements today. The prophetic room is going to be taking place uh, in, the, in the foyer today. You're doing that, Dan? Yeah, Dan Caps. So um, between 11 and 12, if you're interested in, in uh, Dan hopefully giving you a good word, uh, come in the back. There's some 10-minute sessions back here to sign up for. Uh, Donna Long will be back there to uh, facilitate you. And we just ask, there's a lot of people in the church that are interested. So if you do this, we ask you only do it once every three months, okay? That gives everybody a chance to, uh, to get involved. And some, the same person doesn't go there every week and every week. So when God gives you a word, pray on it, think on it, meditate on it, and act on it. And then we'll see where it goes from there. There's a newcomers class in the fellowship hall today, right after service. If you're new to the community, um, we suggest you come back and learn a little bit more about us. Pastor John will lead that. There'll be some lunch provided back here. Also happening after service today at 12:30, um, we're going to have sidearm proficiency 101. Uh, I was told it was probably a waste of time to bring my cap gun because I don't have a sidearm. Uh, anyway, it's in the back, unloaded sidearms. I think he told me not to bring my cap gun because he was afraid I'd have caps in it, you know. So anyway, uh, so just uh, it's going to be in the, up in the youth room today. And, uh, you know, you check your gun before it comes in. Randy's going to check it again. And if you got anything in it, you lost it. So, women of the uh, the women's weight loss supports on Monday nights, six o'clock in room 101, and then also it goes into the co-ed rev. Uh, Monday night at seven and Thursdays at 10 o'clock. Sharon's leading that. So if you have any questions, get with Sharon Brisbane. On the first this week, Wednesday, the hub will be in the back, uh, fellowship hall. 5.30, then there's a devotional time, and then there's a grocery giveaway. Freedom Falls Youth Group meets on Wednesdays, 6.30 to 8.30, upstairs in the youth room. ESL is on their last class for the summer, and that's this Thursday. So after that, they're going to take summer break. Moms with Littles will be uh, meeting Friday the 3rd from 9.30 to 11.30. Kara's down here. She can fill you in on that. The Young Adult Group, Spirit and Truth, will also meet on Friday the 3rd, 6 to 8 in the youth room. See Shane if you have any questions about that. Next Sunday, the 5th, there will be a back-to-school bash meeting. If you're interested, and it's going to be a planning meeting, it'll be uh, back in room 103, the men's prayer room. See Thera, Sarah Thapa for more information. And then the big one right now, the Women of the Vine uh, Ladies' Lunch, Mother's Day Spring Lunch, takes place in the Fellowship Hall next Saturday on the 11th. It's a good time for the ladies of the church and their friends to be involved. If you have any questions, see Donna Long. There is a sign-up sheet there. They request that you bring a side dish or a dessert or something. And then as we just go from there, the Tuesday Gifts of the Spirit class think went over exceptionally well uh, talking to Dale and Pam and to most of those who participated so that class ended last week but it's going to morph into a prayer class starting this Tuesday same time Donna's going to lead it so it'll just be a great uh, it'd be a great time to continue there were some relationships built there and speaking into each other's lives and it's going to be a good time of prayer so the last one I have, well, I have two. Dan, get ready for a missions moment. Come on up, Dan. And then uh, Dan and I are going to be taken off Tuesday, headed to, uh, should I say rescue those guys over there? <laughs> no. We're, we're, tag team. We're going to go over and tag team. Yeah, it's going to be our, our turn to, to wrestle. Um, 
but since I'm going to be gone, uh, Pam's still struggling a little bit to get in the building, so the office will basically be closed next week, okay? So just uh, if you have a phone call you got to make, still make your phone calls because if she's not here to answer it, it goes to the voicemail and it goes to her computer. I think John sees them, Pam sees them, so you know, you're not being neglected if you can't reach somebody at the church. So that's what I got. Daniel? Thank you, brother. I just want to let you all know that I've gotten at least seven or eight calls from the team in Ukraine so far. Probably the most uh, fun one was there's a uh, translator in the Roma church, and him and I have a really good uh, relationship, and I got this video call from him, and he said to me, do you recognize these two bald men? And it was Pastor Victor and our, lo <laughs> our own Tom Bloom, and they're sitting at a table signing the paperwork and receiving the house. So, uh, hallelujah. Everything went according to God's plan. The paperwork has been completed. In fact, I talked to Timea, who is our Ukrainian translator, who told me that everyone who came from here, so the six that left here, are all living in that house. That's where they're staying. Which Bob and I will, you know, we'll have to get some sleeping bags and, you know, out on the street a little bit. But until they leave, then we can move into the house. No, so anyway, I'm joking. That was a, uh, a, a really, it's been a good week for me, hearing from them. You know, they're finding some needs and asking me to bring cell phones or anything I can find like that. So I'm receiving stuff. I may have to get another suitcase, but we're going to make sure that everything that they are finding that they need is going to get over there. You guys, your prayers your tithes and offerings have been received extremely well. And um, yeah, we're, I, I believe that this will mark a new transition into how God is going to use Community Vineyard and ETC to minister to Ukraine that's in a dire need right now, especially with the refugee and the rebuilding of the church. So that's my update. Hallelujah. Thank you. Pray for Bob and I. We leave, Like you said, we leave on Tuesday. We're going to tag team with those guys. They're really excited, but I'm sure by the time we get there, they'll be a little tired. And so we'll, we'll pick up for them there. And then, and then Bob and I will be there for another week ministering with the, more of the Ukrainian churches. God bless you. I'm dismissing the kids now and say hi to your neighbors, heading to that prophetic room if anybody is feeling led.
Good morning. I told, uh, I told Laura that I didn't have a joke coming up here. And she, she gave me one. She, uh, she showed me her phone and it said, it said, by the time a giraffe, by, if, a, if a giraffe takes a sip of coffee, by the time it gets down its throat, it's already cold. Did you ever think of that? No, because you're selfish. <laughs> so that's, that's the best I have for a joke today. <laughs> I would encourage you guys, uh, if, if you are, or if you have been visiting with us for a while, please make your way out to the newcomer's luncheon. Uh, you know, Bob usually makes a, a lot of food there. And, and it, how many of you guys have ever hosted meals at your house? It feels good, right, when people eat all the food? So even if you, uh, you know, aren't a member or, or, uh, or if you don't want to be a member or you are a member, you can come back and get some food. There should be plenty for everybody. So, uh, but it is a really good time. The whole point of the members luncheon is to just get plugged in and get connected to people. So if you ever, if you've been coming for a while, even if you are a member and you don't really feel connected to folks, it'd be a really good time to, to just pop in and get connected. So, all right. So. This isn't a joke. I wish it was, but I'm going to start by sharing something that happened in 1992. Now, pay attention to the year. This happened, what I'm about to describe to you, happened in 1992. When an apartment building got caught on fire in an Orthodox Jewish apartment complex, Rather than calling the fire department, the residents of the first building that caught on fire went to their local rabbi to determine if it was lawful on the Sabbath to call the fire department. Now, this may seem strange, but to them, using a phone would break an electrical current and was thus considered to be a form of work that would violate the Jewish law on the Sabbath. And in the half an hour that it took for the rabbi to determine that it was actually lawful for them to make the call, two other buildings burnt to the ground. Now, luckily in this story, you hear, and it's, it's a tragedy. Luckily, no one was hurt. And I'm sure that it was probably very comforting to the other families whose homes, possessions, and family photos, and Family heirlooms burned down. I'm sure it was very comforting for them that these two men followed their commitment to orthodoxy. And as unbelievable as this sounds, these kind of ridiculous rules and regulations have actually been occurring in Judaism for thousands of years. And the sad thing about it is that all these rules were written and followed as a means to, of people to try to f get actually like closer to God. They were trying to create these rules so that it might somehow bridge a gap between them and God. But the pain and the suffering that was inflicted upon people who, first of all, were victims of these rules, but also those who tried to follow them actually separated them from God. They completely missed the heart of God, completely. And like I said a few weeks ago, the word Pharisee is probably the greatest irony in all of Scripture. It means separated ones. They chose their own name. They called themselves the Pharisees to indicate that they were separated from the world. But in reality, the great sad irony of this is the more they created these rules to try to please God, the further they were away from him. Thankfully, though, we have the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. Not, not all those in that time period or before that time period did. We have the life and the teachings of Jesus Christ to guide us and to bring us back to knowing the heart of God. Let's pray. Father, more than anything in the world, we want to be in relationship with you. And more than anything in the world, that's what you want too. So here we stand just longing for a connection with you, God. And you are so good and so faithful that if that is the desires of our heart, that you will meet that need. So here we are, a, a body of believers who want, we just want to know you and to be loved by you and to love you back, Lord. And so I just thank you for that. I just thank you for that. And I trust that we will 
come to know the heart of God today. In Jesus' name, amen. So as a recap, for those who weren't here, I'm finishing a series uh, called Relationship Over Religion. This is going to be the last part before we dive into the Sermon on the Mount next week. <clears throat> and, and before Luke pivots into the Sermon on the Mount, there are just, there's just one more example of the themes that we've been reading, that we've been studying. We just have one more example. And they're all connected, they're all related. First, Jesus, and, and these are the themes, okay? So first, Jesus set off to recalibrate our understanding and the understanding of his, of, of his disciples of the heart of God. More specifically, who God is and how much he loves us, even though his love can be, <clears throat> even though uh, his love can be a little bit hard to understand if you're just reading the Old Testament. It's also during this early phase of his ministry that Jesus made some quite astounding claims. So he's creating a foundation of who God the Father is and the heart of the Father, and then he began to make some quite astounding claims about himself. So from two weeks ago, he first gave himself the title Son of Man, which was a reference to the Messiah from the book of Daniel. And this was akin to calling himself God. This would have been a, a stonable offense back then. Then we saw last week that he made clear that he was not coming to reform or change the Jewish law, but that he actually came to completely fulfill it and thus making the heart of the law more important than the letter of the law. So this is the contrast that we're seeing. We're seeing the contrast between relationship and religion. And, and just to clarify too, I think it's important that we define the word religion in, this, in the context that I'm talking about it. Now many people in many different places and denominations might have a different name or a different sort of definition of religion. When I have been speaking, and I probably should have clarified this right from the very beginning, when I talk about religion in this series, I'm talking about, it's, it's sort of synonymous with legalism, okay? So it's a lot of, some people will say religion means that you're a Christian or religion means that you're, you go to church or something like that, and those are different definitions. For the purposes of this, religion really is this legalism that the, the Jewish people were following, okay? <clears throat> So also, another thing that has been increasing, increasingly relevant as a mention as part of the recap is what is meant by the law in these passages. So we've started to see there's been this reference to the law. Now, anytime you read the law in the Old Testament, what they're referring to is the Pentateuch, and they're referring to all of the, the rules. There's like 260 some rules and regulations spread throughout the Pentateuch, okay? But actually, as, as we have been reading in the New Testament, many of the ways that they, when they refer to the law in the New Testament, they're actually talking about all of these extra rules that were added on by the Jewish believers, right? So when, when the Pharisees come and they accuse Jesus, uh, the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law accuse Jesus of doing something that is, quote, unlawful, they're not actually talking about the old Testament laws. They're talking about what we might refer to as extra biblical religious laws that are actually not found in the Bible at all. So that's where it gets a little confusing if you're reading this and they're like, you know, they're, they're harvesting, they're eating grain. That's going to be our reading for today. They're eating grain, sort of harvesting. You're like, why? Where is that in the Old Testament that they're not allowed to just eat grain? Well, it's actually, it's actually not in the Old Testament. It's actually in a book called the Mishnah. Now, there were these extra-biblical sources um, that were sometimes called the Oral Torah. And there's a few that I'm going to talk about today. There's the Mishnah, the Gemara, and the Talmud that created all of these extra-biblical rules, okay, that were sort of loosely based off of the ideas that were found in the Old Testament. But what they failed to do is they failed to actually get at the heart of the Father. And the more they created these laws, because they just kept adding to them, them, and, then, and then as culture and, and technology and things would arise and shift, they would add to these laws, and as they continued to add to these laws, things got stricter and stricter. There was less and less freedom, and in fact, with every new addition, they were moving away from the heart of the Father. It's taking one step at a time. <clears throat> now, I think it's interesting if you guys want to Google and look up some of those laws and Google and look up some of the oral Torahs. They're very fascinating, but that's, I'm not going to get into that. I could do like a whole, you know, series on those. 
Um, but my point in bringing it up in today's scripture reading is because they accuse Jesus of allowing his disciples to break the law. They're not referring to Old Testament laws. They're referring to these sort of extra documents. But in writing these down, they slowly began to drift away from the heart of the Father. And this is where we pick up with Jesus setting them straight yet again. So we have chapter 6, verse 1. One Sabbath... Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick up some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Okay, so when they're talking about the law, this isn't the Pentateuch, this isn't the Old Testament, these are these extra-biblical laws. So this violated the law from the Mishnah, that someone was not allowed to thresh grain on the Sabbath. I'm sure you guys have all had a lot of experience with threshing grain, so you know exactly what that means. Nobody, nobody knows what that means. <laughs> what it is, is it's actually separating the wheat from the chaff. Separating the edible part from the non-edible part, okay? And although strangely enough in this passage, they're just kind of walking along, you would think that that was like theft, but it's actually not illegal. For all the laws that they do have, it's actually not illegal to just walk through a stranger's field and eat what you can get, grab up. I thought that was kind of interesting as long as you use your hands and no tools, and as long as you're not doing it on the Sabbath. But if you take just a whole handful and you eat the stuff that's not really edible with the grain, I suppose that's lawful, right? Do you see how ridiculous this gets? Another interesting thing to notice is that the Pharisees were present. Well, why were the Pharisees present? That seems like a strange thing. Jesus and his disciples are walking through the fields and the Pharisees are present taking notes. Well, why were they present? Well, the main reason had to do with the two instances of supposed blasphemy that Jesus did in the previous chapter. They already had witnessed these things, and they begun to follow him around to build a case. And they specifically followed him around in the Sabbath because the Sabbath had the most ridiculous laws and the ones that were the most hard to actually keep. So they knew that Jesus was probably, or one of his disciples, was probably going to break one of these laws. And, and at that time, again, one of these extra rules was that a teacher could be held responsible for the actions of their disciples. So they're not actually accusing Jesus in this passage. They're accusing his disciples, which was an ac accusation against him, right? Well... If you're curious about what these laws might be, okay, I know I was, I actually have a modern list that I'm going to read to you guys. Now, these are current laws that have been modified. These are current Jewish Orthodox laws that have been modified to fit modern society, but they're all based on the same documents that were present in Jesus' time, and they're still practiced in many places. So we have the first, and they're broken into four categories. The first one is the order of the bread. Now, I didn't list all of these, but here are some of them. No digging. These are all laws on the Sabbath. You're not allowed to dig on the Sabbath. You're not allowed to rake. You cannot drag chairs. So, uh, you know, if you're like cleaning up after a church service or something, you drag a chair. You have to go to the temple and make a sacrifice and an offering and ask forgiveness. This is... Or you could pay them, because that's really what they wanted. You could pay them, and they'll make the sacrifice for you. No planting, fertilizing, watering, picking fruit, grain or flowers, no husking corn, so dinner's off. Can't husk corn. You can't use an aerosol can, bad for people in the 80s. No grinding coffee. Sorry, Polly. Grinding coffee, none of that. Which... That's got to be a sin, like, to not drink coffee in the mornings. Anyway, no, no grinding pepper or mincing, cooking, baking, or reheating food. So everything's cold. No reheating food. Because you can't cook the food, so it can be warm, but you can't reheat it. Reheat it. Uh, second one, making clothes. No removing wool, cutting nails, cutting hair, laundry, combing hair or a wig, coloring or painting. That's bad for the kids. No coloring. Jack can't color on the, on the Sabbath. Uh, basket weaving, pulling a loose thread. If you see a thread on your shirt and you pull it, you're not allowed to make or untie a knot. So, like, tying your shoes. I kind of want to go to an Orthodox church and see how many people had their shoes tied. 
Brain, no, oh, brain's good. <laughs> no sewing, no stapling. Steps for writing, you're not allowed to fold paper, cut paper. Now this is a weird one, I don't quite understand this. You're not allowed to write a meaningful symbol. So you can write a non-meaningful symbol, whatever that is, and you're not allowed to erase anything. I wonder if that means like, like Twitter or like Facebook. You can't like delete or edit anything. <laughs> No, because you can't even use a computer, because here's building. This is under the building section. Creating shelter, extinguishing a flame, turning on an oven, lights, or any other electronics, including making a phone call. This was the, the, the kind of teaching. This is, I mean, this is modern reflections of it. But this is the kind of teaching. So the, the Pharisees were following around Jesus because they had a list of like 40 laws, 40 rules on the Sabbath that he wasn't allowed to do. If he tied his sandals or something, he'd get accused. But Jesus' response here, he answers them, and he gives a reference to 1 Samuel chapter 21. So here's his response. Going on to chapter uh, uh, verse 3. Jesus answered them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for the priest to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus, his, his response was, was interesting, and it was very brilliant, because David at this time was held of like extreme high honor, right? And, and even though he sort of did what was unlawful at the Sabbath, by the way, all these, the Mishnah and all those other extra biblical sources, they weren't written during David's time, right? So he didn't have this sort of weird, skewed interpretation of the Sabbath. But he did eat the, the food that was supposed to be consecrated and given to the priests. And so what Jesus is doing is he, he's, he's showing the heart of the Father isn't for rules. It's for meeting the needs of the people. It's for compassion. This is why you see him healing on the Sabbath. This is why you see him doing what is, quote, unlawful. Because the heart of the Father is to meet the needs of the people because he loves us. He doesn't want us to live like this, this weird, you know, constricted life. I mean, how many of you guys would have a really restful, if you had to follow all those rules that I just mentioned, would that be restful and enjoyable for you on the Sabbath? Like the Sabbath is a gift. Jesus te teaches later on that the Sabbath is a gift. It's given to us for our benefit. Right? And so I think it's important for us to understand, like, that's the heart of the Father. The heart of the Father is not to follow all these rules. It's to meet the needs of the people with compassion and to actually, especially for the Sabbath, for us to be able to enjoy it. It's a gift. Another thing that we see, and this is another pattern that we've seen multiple times throughout these passages, throughout these last couple of chapters, is that Jesus gives a really smart answer but he doesn't stop there. And I have to imagine myself as a disciple. Part of me would be like, okay, that was a really smart answer, but just stop. You know, and then he, and then he goes on and says, no, I'm the son of man, claiming to be God. He always goes on and crosses another line. And here Jesus, he does the same thing. He gives a really smart answer, but then he says, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. And you've got to imagine the disciples are just like, oh, man, I wish he would have just stopped with the first one. Now he's going to get us all killed. He elevates himself above not just a custom. Now this, this is the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is, a, is, a fourth, is the fourth commandment. It's, it's one of the Ten Commandments. So it's like kind of important. And he elevates himself above that. And nobody can elevate themselves above a command of God except God. And the apostles, he's like, they've got to be thinking, he's doing it again. Too far, Jesus. Too far. But he doesn't even stop there. He goes on. Now, this happens another week. We don't know how far apart. But on another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking, and he said to the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand in front of everyone. 
So he got up and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or destroy it. See, Jesus didn't have to heal this man on the Sabbath. This wasn't like an emergency. He specifically chose. He could have waited till, you know, Sunday or Monday to heal him, right? This wasn't an emergency. He had it for a while. But he told, not only did he choose to heal him on the Sabbath, but he, he called him to the front. The disciples are like, man, he's doing it again. He's going to get us all killed. He looked around at them all, and he, then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they, what they might do to Jesus. See, he knew what they were thinking. He knew they were trying to trick him. He knew that they were looking for a way to trap him, to accuse him, and even to kill him. And what does he do? He intentionally has the man stand up. He does exactly what any good Jedi would do. He springs the trap. He saw the trap. He springs the trap. That's what they do. He doesn't just heal the man. He reveals the heart of the Father to the audience, as well as the hearts of the people trying to accuse him. That's what he, that's what this is, the pattern that we see. He reveals the heart of the Father, and then he reveals the hearts of the people trying to accuse him. And his words are, of course, brilliant. And that no one in, the, in their right mind, even the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law, would argue that obeying the law is evil. I and mean, it's just unbelievably brilliant. But I like what he says in the court. There's a corresponding story to this in Matthew 12. To me, the, you know, Matthew records something a little bit different that, that illustrates this even a step further. I really like what he says. He says, this is uh, chapter 12, verse 11 and 12. He said to them, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Does anyone know the real reason for the Sabbath? I kind of alluded that it was for us to enjoy it and for us to, you know, to rest a little bit. And that's, that's partly true, but that's actually not the real reason for the Sabbath. Anyone know the real reason for the Sabbath? I'm not asking for answers. I am, I am looking for Bob Struble, though, because I bet you he knows as a theologian. <laughs> Most people think it's so that we can rest, but that's really not what it is at all. If you experience rest, that's just a byproduct of it. But I'll give you a hint. The real reason for the Sabbath is the same reason for the tithe. Have you ever made the connection? The real reason for the Sabbath is the same reason for the tithe. It's because God wants us to be reminded of who our provider really is. Think about it. In an agrarian society, taking a day off meant that you might run the risk of cutting your productivity by one-seventh, especially during harvest season, which was a big deal. But God knew the value of the Sabbath, and he actually promised the Israelites in the Old Testament that he would make up for the one day of supposed lost productivity because he wanted to give them a weekly reminder of who their provider was. It's the same, way, the same reason we tithe. We tithe because it should be a reminder of who our provider is. Yes, of course, we tithe to help, you know, help the church and help build God's kingdom and all those other reasons. But the real reason that we should be tithing and the real reason that we should be celebrating the Sabbath is to remind ourselves of who our provider is. He didn't do it because he needs our money and he didn't do it, he didn't institute the Sabbath because he needs our blind obedience. He did it as a gift to us to remind us how dependent we really are on him. Because people, I mean, you guys know, people have a tendency Part of our human nature, our sin nature, is to forget that we are supposed to be in a very dependent relationship on Him. Listen, I'm about to say something. I'm going to forewarn you guys. I'm going to say something that might get you upset. <clears throat> are you ready? ready? If your tithe and your Sabbath don't remind you of your dependence on God, you aren't doing it right. I'm just going to leave it right there. You can, 
you can just take that and you can pray about it and see if there's some sort of a new application that you may want to you may want to think about how to adjust your tithe and how to adjust your Sabbath. Now, the truth is actually that these passages, even though I did take a little bit of a liberty to, to teach on the Sabbath, I felt like that's what the Lord wanted me to do. These passages aren't really about the Sabbath at all. It's not like a teaching on the Sabbath. I just thought I'd throw it in for free. The teachings, the purpose of these passages, the reason that it's the way that they are over and over in Luke, these four, these four passages that I've sort of, you know, uh, you know, all in a row, is so that we could know the heart of the Father. I hope you can start to see who the God of the Bible really is. I hope that you can see the God of the Bible is a God of compassion, that He's concerned with meeting your needs. He's concerned with the things that concern you and he even wants you to be happy. Oh my gosh, the God of the Bible wants you to be happy. He actually wants to meet your wants. You know, I could tell you, uh, I could share with you guys probably a dozen stories of like in my mind, different things that would make my heart sing that probably nobody else would even care about. The most recent ones, some of you guys have heard me, I've been talking about the last few weeks. I love collecting comic books. I do. I just, I just, I like organizing them. I like sorting through them. I like kind of seeing what you have and kind of putting them in cases and adding them to my collection. There's just something really peaceful and calming in a, in a, in a house full of chaos with our kids running around making messes. When they go to sleep, there's just total quiet and I can just, I don't know, spend a little bit of time doing that. And the Lord has gifted me in recent weeks with, you know, and, and somebody, I, I bought some comics from somebody that was really just has made my heart sing. Listen, God wants to make your heart sing. He knows that little thing. There's probably not a single person in this entire congregation that could care less if they got 500 comics. But for me, that made, that made my heart sing. That gave me rest. That's something that I enjoy. Listen, He knows what you enjoy. He wants to give you the things that you enjoy. He wants, he's a good father. That's what we sang about this morning. He's a good father. He loves you. Those little things that make your heart sing that nobody else really knows about or maybe just your spouse knows about. He wants to give those things to you. He's a good father. He wants to be involved in your life. He wants to be in a real vibrant life-bringing relationship with you. He's not some faraway God. He knows the things that you want and the things that you need, and he, he knows the things that, even aren't, that aren't even on your radar, and he wants to open up your eyes and then bless you. He wants to be your provider. This is the heart of the Father that Jesus is trying to reveal to the people. We also see in these passages that God is not what I'm sorry, that he is not and what, he doesn't want blind obedience from us. He doesn't. He doesn't even want you to try to follow the rules without him. Not that any of us could. We, we can't follow the rules. We can't follow any of the sort of supposed rules. A lot of people, a lot of, Christ, a lot of people who are skeptics of Christianity think that Christianity is just this, you know, I, I become a Christian, I have to follow all these rules. God doesn't want a blind obedience from you. He actually doesn't want you to follow the rules at all outside of relationship with him. That's why when I meet somebody who's not a Christian and they say, but I do all these good things, I do all these good works, I, do, I like biblical morals and values, I'm just not a Christian, I do all these good works, God actually doesn't want any of that stuff. He wants a relationship with you more than he wants the rules. Relationship over religion, relationship over legalism. He doesn't, that, that's not his point, that isn't his heart, isn't for us to follow the rules. Because the truth is, even if we are coerced into white-knuckled obedience, if we don't have a relationship with him, if we don't have faith, it's impossible to please God. It's one of the reasons he wants our hearts first and foremost. And then once he has a relationship with us, he will slowly work all the junk out. He'll slowly work all the sin out. He'll slowly work all the darkness out. He'll slowly work all of that stuff out. 
I loved what Shane shared last week during our ministry time. Basically, he said that God doesn't hate sin because of the act, per se, but, be, but because he hates what it does to us, because we are his beloved children and sin destroys us. But he also knows that there can be no actual victory from sin without him. Like, that's not even possible. Scripture says in Romans that we're slaves to sin without him. There can be no victory at all, from freedom at all from sin without Christ. <clears throat> that's why the, the rules that the Jewish leaders created were impossible to follow, and that's why they actually led people away from God. The truth is that rules, even if you can follow them, can sometimes be easier than real relationship. You can follow the rules and not have a relationship with Christ. There's people, sadly, all over the world that do that. A real relationship with God can be messy because it means that you're actually transparent and fully vulnerable with Him. You can tell Him when you're angry and upset or even disappointed with Him. How many of you guys have ever honestly told God that you were angry at Him? He can take it. It's okay. He knows anyway. But if you don't have that conversation with Him, then it's not real relationship. You're hiding part of, part of yourself from Him. Trying to follow the rules without the heart of the Father is dead and empty, and it leads you away from the Father. We don't sin out of blind obedience. We don't sin out of, we don't sin out of blind obedience. We don't sin because we love the Lord and we trust Him to meet our needs. Does that make sense? We don't sin because we love Him. It's not because we're afraid of Him. Let me give you an example, okay? Let's take infidelity in marriage, okay? By the way, infidelity in marriage is the same as idol worship from the Ten Commandments with God. So these are kind of the same things. The same heart is at the, the core of each of these things. Now, stick with me, Kara. I, <laughs> listen, I don't avoid cheating on my wife because I'm afraid of the consequences. And the consequences would be great like, people need to understand the consequences of divorce. Not only would I break her heart, I'd break the hearts of probably a hundred others. I would harm my children more than I could ever imagine, and I would be a terrible witness to Christ, to the world, and probably a hundred other things that I could never imagine. But believe it or not, the reason I don't cheat on my wife isn't because of any of those things. I avoid cheating on my wife because I love her. I don't cheat on her because I can't imagine giving my heart and myself to anybody else. I don't cheat on her because it makes me happy to make her happy and it would break my heart to see her heart broken. This is the difference between religion and relationship. I could not cheat on her because of all of those consequences. That's legalism. But I don't do it because I love her. God doesn't want your obedience out of fear for the consequences, even though the consequences would be great. He wants your obedience out of love and relationship because it makes you happy to make him happy. We have to get this, church. This is the only real way to access the freedom that we have in Christ. This is the only real way that we can actually walk out of sin is if we have a loving, passionate, life-giving, beautiful, innocent, and pure relationship with the Father. So much so that you can't even imagine walking in sin. It doesn't even, it doesn't even come into your, into your, in your framework or your mind because you just love him so much. Why would I want to do that? It would break his heart. I don't want to break his heart. I want to do what pleases him because I love him. This is the foundation that Jesus is laying for the disciples. That real obedience flows out of relationship, not religion, not legalism.
It's kind of a big deal. This is, this is why he started his early ministry with this. This is a foundational teaching. And this is why we see so many Christians not walking in freedom. And you've got to wonder, where are they at with their relationship with the Lord? And I understand, we're all in process. Don't, please don't mishear me. I, God does not expect perfection from you. We are in process. I get all of that, okay? But you cannot put on a suit and walk around like you're perfect when you're rotten to the core inside. You cannot walk around like we should know people by their fruit. We should be the joyous people in the world because we are walking free, because we have freedom from sin. The people who are walking around grumpy and, and you know, putting on this facade, I gotta wonder if they're free from sin. I mean, I guess I don't know for sure, but, but the more free from sin that you get, it seems to me the happier you are. Because you know, like that's what freedom sounds like. That's what joy sounds like. People are walking around joyful. That makes evangelism easy. It makes discipleship easy. It makes serving easy because you're, all of it is coming from an overflow tank because you think of yourself, oh my gosh, I'm finally free. I'm free to love Christ. I'm free to serve Christ. This is a foundational teaching that Jesus is trying to get into us. We've got to learn to walk in freedom, and it comes, from, we, it comes from just loving Jesus, spending time with him in prayer. That's why I've been talking so much about the importance of prayer. You spend time in prayer. You spend time just enamored with the awe and the beauty of, of Jesus and the, and the word and all of these things. It just fills you to a place of overflowing that, like, oh, my gosh, you can't even think about that thing that you used to do. You're like, it's like not even a blip on your radar. Now I'm going to invite the worship to, to come up. As we get ready to close this series, I want to encourage you to get out of these passages what Luke wanted you to get out of them. The heart of the Father is to be in relationship with us. And I've shared over the, few, the last few weeks some practical ways that you can actually grow in your relationship with Him, that you can get to know Him. I passed out spiritual practices. I've encouraged everyone here to consider participating or leading a prayer group. And now I want to go back to basics. Even more foundational than this teaching is actually receiving Christ into your heart and actually submitting yourself to Jesus. One of the primary purposes in life is to know God. It's the reason he created all of us, to know him and to love him. It's the reason for the plan of salvation. It's the reason for the gospel and the cross. Listen, Jesus really did, like he really did die on a cross. And he did it because he loves you and he wants to be close with you. And if you've never really, if you, if you don't know, if you don't have a memory in your mind of receiving Jesus as an adult, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. And for the rest of us who are, who are saved and been baptized and been walking this out for a while, my challenge to you is to pursue him, especially if you're not walking in this kind of freedom. Pursue him. It's natural to feel far away from him sometimes, but you've got to shake yourself free. You've got to dust yourself off. You've got to get up and you've got to seek him You've got to shake yourself free from your same old lifestyle, same old routine. Seek him, pursue him, read scripture, join a prayer group, immerse yourself in a biblical community, embrace discipleship, but do not live a life without him and without freedom anymore. So I'm gonna lead us into a prayer. If you guys would just stand. I just wanna want lead us into a prayer. I'm gonna lead us into a prayer for those who who cannot remember a, a time in their life when they've received Christ, when they've submitted themselves to the Lord. It's going to sound like the sinner's prayer. It's a beautiful prayer. I think even those of us who are saved should still pray it. And for the rest of you, I, I'm going to add a, something a little, you know, on the end of it, okay? Lord Jesus, I know... I know that I have sinned against you. I ask for your forgiveness. 
I believe that you died on a cross for my sins and rose from the dead. And I turn from those things. I repent of those things. I ask that the power of the Holy Spirit would would enable me to have this freedom that's talked about today. I invite you to come into my heart and into my life, and I ask that you would help me to trust you and to follow you as my Lord and Savior. For those who have been following Christ for a while, Lord, I'm, a, I'm just in awe with your goodness. I love you so much, God. I love this process that I'm in, even though it doesn't feel great all the time. Lord, I ask that you would help me to embrace this process. I hope that you would renew the fire in me, the passion in me, the curiosity in me, Lord, for your world and for your kingdom. Speak to me and gently show me what it is that you want me to do to grow closer to you. Lord, that's my heart. I know that it's so hard to break routines and to do new things, Lord. But I ask that the Holy Spirit that dwells richly inside me would enable me to take one step closer to you, Lord, so that I might, so that I might be able to enjoy your presence and live a life that brings you glory, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship him together. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us, come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us, come rest on us. Ooh, come down, Spirit.
So there. All right, I'll see. Check one. All right. So, um, is it good? Screen light. Check one, two. Okay, good. So there was this one, one line from a psalm that was on, just on my heart as we've been singing, and uh, shared it with Pastor John. And it's, I just believe something the Lord has to encourage us with, and then I wanted to pray over us. And it's very simple. It's from Psalm 51, restore to me the joy of your salvation. And I believe the Lord has just on his heart um, to remind us of um, that this is, this is meant to be a, a joy walk with him, uh, the joy of our salvation. And he wants to restore that in each and every one of us, anything that the enemy is um, came to steal, kill, and destroy. I just, I'm going to pray over us, believing that God has life that he wants to breathe into that space. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that this walk is, Lord Jesus, with you. Um, as First Peter says, there, there is joy inexpressible and filled with glory. God, for people here who right now are not sensing that, Lord, we are just thanking you that your heart is that they would taste and see that you are good and that your salvation is good. And so, Lord, we ask that you'd restore the joy of our salvation. God, that everybody here, Lord Jesus, would have eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord, your love and your goodness in the gospel. And that anything that the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy, we thank you for your life coming into those spaces. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are a God of restoration. So again, anything, God, that, that is, has been attacked by the enemy, we just thank you that it won't prosper and that your kingdom would just come and your will would be done in that space that, Lord Jesus, you would just fill us with fresh childlike joy in our salvation, Lord, that it would be fresh and new again, just like a, a baby, Lord God, just in all of its freshness and newness, Lord, the joy of our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
to invite the prayer team to come up. It's interesting, Jordan shared that word on joy, and uh, that's that's what the Lord had been speaking to me uh, more than once in the last few weeks, is just everywhere I've been going, there just seems to be, I don't know, like, it's just like unexplainable. It's just joy, joyful to be in the Lord's presence. And so I do understand, I you know, different people are going through different things, and life isn't easy. And so I want to invite our prayer team to come up, and, and we do want to pray for you that that would just be restored, okay? So if, if you, in particular, if you've been kind of struggling and life isn't as joyous, if you're not walking around all bubbly like some of us, <laughs> just hitting the spirit, because um, we really should. As Christians, it's not just our salvation or our freedom from sin. It's all the blessings of the Lord and just being able to sense his presence and knowing, you know, when you when you go to sleep at night, just knowing that you are his beloved and that you are his favored one and, and just walking in his anointing, that should bring us joy, right? And so I'm gonna I'm gonna pray that over everybody here and then you guys, you know, can can be dismissed and, and hang out in the foyer and lobby if you want. But if you if you really feel like the Lord's joy has just been hard for you to like grasp in the season that you're in. We really want to pray that the Lord would restore that. So let me just bless you guys. Father, we we come before you and, and you are just so good. You are a good dad. I pray, Lord, I just come against anything that's happened in our past, any of the struggles that we might have had with our own fathers that, that make it difficult for us to fully embrace you as a good father. I come against that in Jesus' name right now, and I pray that the Holy Spirit would would restore what the enemy has stolen, that, that the Holy Spirit would, would interweave into our very heart and our spirit and our minds how good you truly are, God. I pray also that you would actually show these people in a tangible way your goodness. And Lord, I pray a blessing over everybody as we depart, as we go about our business this week, Lord, I pray that we would carry with us the joy of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.
If you'd like a little bit more joy in your life, come on up. We just want to impart that on you. Uh, have a great week, everyone.